Good day, everyone, and welcome to our webinar for the 4th of March, 2020. Uh, a lot has happened in the last month, but two major issues really have come to the fore. The first one is, of course, the budget, and the second one is the impact of the coronavirus on world markets. So I'm going to first start with uh, corona and look at that, and then we'll go on and talk about the budget. So obviously the coronavirus has made rapid progress. <laughs> it's been spreading quickly in various different countries. But it would appear to me that uh, it is reaching a plateau in China. Um, and obviously uh, we're now seeing a situation where of the 70 odd thousand people that have been confirmed cases of corona in China, approximately half of them have been discharged and have returned home as being well again. Um, so that, that is good news because it shows that most people are not affected. In fact, the death rate in China has reached 2.3%. Um, that's roughly where it is. Uh, obviously, in other countries, there's been a rapid spread, most noticeably in the United States, where nine people have died so far, and in South Korea, Italy, and Iran. It's looking more like a world pandemic, but um, there are some signs of hope on the horizon. And clearly it's unnerved markets. If you look on your screen now, you'll see how it's impacted on the S&P 500. We had a, a, a seven trading days when the market fell every single day. And then there was a major rally here. This was a 4.6% rally in a single day. And then last night, despite the Federal Reserve Bank dropping interest rates by half a percent, which is almost unheard of in an emergency measure because of corona, still the market fell 2.8% from that high point there. Um, well, of course, uh, cor corrections are always most dramatic at the beginning. They then tend to settle down and... Um, you know, a sideways movement begins. So far, from the peak here at uh, 3386 down to this bottom point here at uh, 2954, we're looking at a 12.5% fall. But you mustn't forget that the market at this point up here was overdue for a correction, and the coronavirus provided the perfect reason. Obviously, the impact of stimulating the uh, U.S. economy has had an impact on shares, uh, but this may well be what we call a dead cat bounce, and I'll talk more about that later. Most corrections go down to between 10 and 20 percent. We wrote an article at the end of January about the corona correction, and in that article we said between 10 and 20 percent was the most likely area. So, so far we're down 12.5%, we're well into that territory. Um, what you should be looking for now is a period of backing and filling, sort of like a sideways market, which will show you that the worst news has been discounted and the market is digesting and trying to absorb this new factor. In our view, this is definitely a correction and not the start of a new bear trend. With the slowing infection and death rate in China, and more than half of the confirmed cases in China having been discharged, we believe that uh, this, this uh, epidemic will probably be contained. Um, most of the people being, who are dying are elderly people who already have some sort of existing health condition. There are at the moment 293 clinical trials of existing drugs to determine whether or not they will have a beneficial impact on the coronavirus. The best of these is one called Remdesivir, Remdesivir uh, in America, or Remdesivir, um, and that has showed some good signs and they are busy with uh, trials of that drug to see the impact. Also, there is a possibility of a vaccine. A company in the States has produced a vaccine, which is currently in 
phase one clinical trials in Seattle. Obviously, you can also see on the same chart the 200-day moving average, uh, which is here, and the previous cycle low, which is there, at a, at a level of 2887 or 2886. And you'll see that when it came down, this correction bounced off that cycle low, which gives us some hope. It confirms that level 2886 as an important level. And of course, some smart investors will now be looking for bargains. But the market must get used to the corona problem first. There's an old saying in Wall Street, Wall Street, and that is that if you drop a dead cat from high enough, it will bounce, but it's still dead. And that's one to remember. The question really is, can the coronavirus really de derail the massive boom which is going on in the American economy? There are patchy in reports of industries which have been affected. Uh, I read results from AB InBev, uh, and uh, that is obviously the biggest brewing company in the world. They're making beer. They, they bought out um, SA Breweries for $107 million, billion dollars a little while ago. AB InBev says in its December quarter results that it lost $285 million worth of sales but that's about a, a half a percent of the sales that it made in that quarter. But even though it's only a half percent drop in sales, investors have taken the AB InBev share down 21% over that seven days. Now let's look at the JSC overall index, and I want to look here at a long-term chart, um, just to put this thing into context, because when, when you have dramatic news like this, it's always easy to get out of context. So here we've got the JSC overall index going back to February 1985. And as you can see, we're showing the 1987 crash, there it is, the 1998.com crash, there it is, and the 2008 subprime crisis. And I want to draw your attention to these uh, red circles here, which are the dead cat bounces. It's very common in a bear trend, a sharp bear trend like this, to get a dead cat bounce, which is a bull trap. It fools bulls into getting into the market too early. And as you can see, it happened in 87, it happened in 1998, and again in 2008. And what you can also see here is that the market has been moving up in a channel for a long time. And remember, this is the JSE overall index. But that right now, we are on this lower channel line and probably bouncing off it at the moment. So in our view, the balance of probabilities must be that the bull trend will continue. That bull trend's been in place for 11 years, and I don't think that there's sufficient evidence yet to say that we are in any kind of bear trend. And of course, that upward trend is also being confirmed in the commodity market. Palladium on Friday last week reached a new record high at $2795, $2,795 per ounce. Manufacturers of auto catalysts are clearly not expecting any fall in world sales of cars. Otherwise, they wouldn't be stocking up in palladium. In the 2003 uh, crisis with the SARS virus, also in China, China was just 4% of the world's economy. Today, it is 16%. So it's having four times the impact on the world economy that it used to have. In fact, a rumor that went around that a cure had been found for corona, it was just a rumor, it wasn't substantiated, caused the oil price to jump by 4%. And that shows how uh, responsive people are to anything that's impacting on commodities. Corona is expected to shave as much as 2% of Chinese growth this year. 100,000 Chinese tourists visit South Africa every year in normal situation, so we can expect our tourism industry to take a bit of a knock. So what is our advice? Our advice is to watch closely, particularly watch the S&P 500 closely, look for signs of that sideways market, and watch out for the dead cat bounce. All right, let's talk a little bit about the budget now. Obviously, the budget uh, 
was dramatic, to put it mildly, uh, but Tito and Buweni's cuts to uh, the civil service wage bill came as a welcome relief to business and to the ratings agencies. The question really is, does Cyril Ramaphosa and do Cyril Ramaphosa and Tito and Buweni have the political strength within the ANC to pull it off? Kosatu, the union movement, is spoiling for a fight. They are saying the government will end up with egg on their face. In other words, they will have to back down. Moody's has come out and said that they don't think that Ramaphosa and Mbaweni can actually pull off these cuts. And of course, we have always predicted here at PDSnet that there would be a confrontation between the government and the union sooner or later. And now it's happening. But at this stage, Ramaphosa has support, according to recent polls, from about 62% of South Africans of all race groups and all income levels. So he's got solid support. He also is in a situation where the union trade union movement has taken a couple of serious blows, most notably AMCU, probably the most militant union of all, led by uh, Joseph Matunjwa, has taken a bruising from Neil Froneman at Sibanya Gold. And that obviously is going to impact on this result, I have no doubt. And of course, the other factor to take into account here is that there simply is no alternative. The government can't borrow anymore. It can't raise taxes any further. The South African Reserve Bank is not about to start printing money in some sort of quantitative easing program. So the only alternative is to cut government expenditure. And there's no doubt that the civil service has received above inflation in, uh, increases for years and that there are far too many civil servants for a country of this size, probably about a third too many, and that some sort of retrenchment position is going to have to be taken. This can't be dealt with through natural attrition of waiting for people to retire and so on, and voluntary retirement. It's going to require retrenchments, and that is obviously going to incur the wrath of the unions. So some kind of conflict is going to take place, and it will be interesting to see how it rolls out. Probably a strike, but if you recall the last government uh, civil servant strike, it didn't really have much of an impact on business. In fact, a lot of us asked, what are, what are we missing here? Obviously, key services like home affairs uh, were not available, but aside from that, it did, not, uh, it did not have a big impact on the progress of business. And of course, Cyril Ramaphosa, over the, uh, over the last couple of years, has shown himself to be very politically astute. And I'm sure that he has made a careful assessment of the moment at which he has thrown down the gauntlet to the trade union movement. Just looking more broadly at the economy, of course, the 3.1% drop in sales in December should have made us aware that things were not going well in the December quarter. But these disastrous 1.4% decline in GDP in the December quarter uh, came as a bit of a shock. And of course, if you combine it with the September quarter's 0.8% drop, that puts us into a technical recession again. Load shedding is partly to blame, of course. And this figure of minus 1.4% on GDP growth makes it almost certain that Moody's will downgrade South Africa to junk status. If we look at Eskom and the load shedding situation, Eskom is saying a number of things. They're saying that they're going to decommission three of their coal-fired power stations in the next four years. These three power stations produce 11 gigawatts, and of course that must be replaced from where? Obviously from renewable energy of some sort. Cape Town has announced the end of load shedding in the Cape Town area because they have made deals with renewable energy suppliers, wind farms and solar farms, uh, to ensure that Cape Town does not have load shedding. Sol Ramaphosa came out yesterday and said that he is not averse to selling off Eskom's coal-fired power stations to private investors, which is a big move. And then, of course, other people are busy building their own 
electricity capacity. Vendanta, which is a zinc smelting operation, is installing solar power and will use Eskom only for baseload. In fact, the mining sector has got about one and a half gigawatts of power that it can install over the next three years, and that will obviously reduce the load on Eskom. So hopefully this, the uh, stage two load shedding, which we now have to endure, should be relatively short-lived. Inevitably, Eskom will gradually get out of the power generation business completely. While we are talking about the economy, I was uh, interested in Stuart Theobald of the Business Day when he compared the current situation with the situation that existed in South Africa in 2007. In 2007, we had GDP growth of almost 5%, and we had a 0.7% budget surplus, something we haven't seen for 10 years. Over those 10 years, the ANC has done the exact opposite of upliftment. They have actually taken South Africa to the brink of economic collapse. And this can be seen in a number of the reports that I read. Obviously, Nedbank came out yesterday with their financials, and they showed that bad debts had risen by 54% on their books, which shows that consumers are really struggling to pay back debt. In another uh, report that I read, Redefine, which is the second largest property company in South Africa, in its pre-closed roadshow, made this observation. Fiscal policy is a huge problem with stuttering tax collections and an apparent unwillingness of the government to cut the public sector payroll. And obviously that goes right to the heart of the matter. All right, well, all of these things are clearly uh, discounted into the rand. So let's take a look at the rand quickly. Just going to put a bit more data on the screen here. Um, right, this shows the pattern of the rand. Obviously, you understand that this graph is inverted in the sense that it shows the, the rand to the dollar. How, how many rands do you need to buy one dollar? Um, so when this chart is going that way, going upwards, the rand is actually weakening and vice versa. So you can hear, see here where Cyril Ramaphosa was elected in November of 2017, and that was followed by this period which, we, which came to be known as Ramaphoria, when the rand strengthened very sharply. Um, that carried on until February of, uh, of 2018, and then the realization began to penetrate that state capture and the Guptas had done far more damage to the South African economy than anyone realized, and that it would take a long time for that damage to be unwound. And so the RAND retreated all the way back to this level here at about 1550. Since then, it's been moving sort of sideways. And obviously, this move up is the anticipation of the budget. The RAND weakened quite sharply there and actually broke above that support line at 1550. But hope, thankfully, has come back within it now. So it, it's interesting that the RAND has been strengthening over the last couple of days even though the budget is well known and the uh, conflict between um, the Ramaphosa administration and the unions is also out there. So clearly some investors believe that we still have a chance of pulling this off. I now want to talk a little bit about world inflation. So we're moving a bit wider now. Inflation throughout the world and in, especially in the big economies of the G7 is very low. In fact, it's been under 2% for a long, long time, despite the best efforts of central bankers to take the inflation rate up. At the same time, first world economies, most importantly the US, are either approaching or are at full employment. Now, full employment is an economics concept, which means that that's the maximum number of jobs that the economy can actually sustain. Uh, in, in America, the unemployment rate has reached 3.5%, and that is regarded actually as being beyond full employment. When you get to a full employment, economic theory tells us that the shortage of labor should start to cause rising wages. 
and there are early signs in America that wages are actually going up. Central bankers all over the world are universally dovish, which means that they are worried about, they're not worrying about inflation. In fact, they're worrying about the lack of inflation. But what is holding inflation back? Well, there are two main factors, in my opinion, that are holding inflation back. One is the low price of energy, starting with oil, which is trading at around $50 a barrel, less than half of what it was in 2014. And the second is the huge productivity which is flowing from the new technologies out there like smartphones, uh, the internet, uh, cloud computing, and so on. These two factors are obscuring the underlying inflationary pressures in the world economy. A decade of intense monetary policy stimulation with $12.5 trillion pumped into the world economy through quantitative easing. And economists are not really looking at that. But where has that cash gone? Why has inflation stayed so low? No one is asking those questions. It's as if that $12.5 trillion was never printed and injected into the world economy. But it was. That cash is still out there. The non-financial companies of the world are sitting on approximately $7 trillion in cash reserves. Why are they doing that? Mostly because there's still there's a carryover of fear from the 2008 subprime crisis. But they are starting to spend it. And in fact, that, is, that spending is what is causing the boom in the U.S. economy. In our opinion, they will borrow five times that $7 trillion and spend that too. And that is why we believe that the U.S. economy will continue to be in a boom stage. And that, of course, is the fulfillment of what we've been writing about and talking about here at PDSnet for many years. The U.S. boom is gathering momentum, and it's pushing this, this, the S&P index, 500 index, up with it. The resurgence of inflation, we believe, during the 2020s, is basically the next step in that giant bull market, which has been going on already for 11 years. Ken Griffin of Citadel and Ethan Harris of BF, BOFA also see higher inflation coming. The 2020s, in our opinion, will be characterized by high inflation and rising stock markets. Smart investors know this, and they have been pushing the S&P up. The JSC, of course, has been a poor performer, but mainly for local reasons. We believe that sooner or later, it will play catch up. So you need to prepare yourself for that. I just want to talk a little bit about commodities now. The first one I want to talk about is coal. The 2019 Integrated Resource Plan dealt a mortal blow to the coal industry in this country. It, envisage, it envisages a sharp drop in coal consumption here, with coal-fired power stations closing. The coal industry, though, still accounts for roughly 7% of South African GDP and generates about 22% of our foreign currency. And, of course, it's a very large employer. But worldwide, coal-fired power stations are being closed and the international price of coal is falling. At the same time, there's been a sharp drop in oil prices. So I just want to put the oil price on the screen to show you what I'm talking about. Okay, here you can see how oil has fallen from that peak up there of $84 a barrel. This is North Sea Brent oil. And it's come down to the cycle low around $50 a barrel. And now it looks like there may be a downside break through that level of $50. This fall probably represents the growing awareness that com internal combustion engines are passing out of use. It is estimated that by 2040, half of the world's vehicles will be electric. And most of that electricity will be generated from renewable sources. So the Middle East is going to find itself sitting on a lake of oil that nobody wants. Right, let's look at a few companies now. Obviously the entire JSE is down, but if you are an astute investor, when shares are down, you get very excited. 
because that is when the opportunities to buy high quality at a bargain price uh, arise. Don't forget what Warren Buffett said. He said, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when they are greedy. Well, right at the moment, investors certainly are fearful. So maybe it's right. Maybe Buffett is correct and it's time to be a little bit greedy. I want to start off by talking about Hudeco. Hudeco produced its results recently. They are an importer of auto and industrial and consumer products. They have 140 branches throughout South Africa and they sell a range of 230,000 products. In their results for the year to the 30th of November, they showed headline earnings per share up 5.1%. Of course, it's a company which is vulnerable to the RAND because it imports most of what it sells, and it's also vulnerable to GDP growth. So that headline earnings per share of 5.1% is an amazing achievement from a management point of view for such a big company carrying such a large stock. And Hudeco is trading on a price earnings ratio of just 7, with a dividend yield of 5%. So to us, that company is looking like very good value at the moment. It's an extremely well-managed company. The next company I want to talk about is Kumba. You all know Kumba as the iron mining company in South Africa. It's 79% owned by Anglo-American. In the results, in its results for the year to 30th, 31st of December 2019, it produced a free cash flow of 17.1 billion rand and a return on capital employed of 83%. It paid out a cash dividend of just under 16 rand a share. Iron ore prices in 2019 went up by 35%. But this share is sitting on a price earnings ratio of 5.5 and a dividend yield of 13.3%. Obviously, it's a commodity share, so it's risky, but we see it as very cheap at these levels. The next share I want to talk about is Avenge. We have spoken about Avenge before. This once massive construction company is now a two cent penny stock. It's fallen to two cents. In its results for the year, for the six months to the 31st of December 2019, the company reported a net asset value of 12.3 cents. So here's an opportunity to buy a share which has a net asset value of 12.3 cents for just two cents. This company is focusing on two main businesses now and is selling or has sold everything else. It's focusing on Moolmans, which is a mining mining. Uh, a company that supports the mining industry in this country, in South Africa, and also on a company called McDonald, McConnell Cow, Dowell in, a, in Australia, which is doing very well. So Moolmans has returned to profit and Mac, McConnell Dowell is making money in Australia. The company has managed through the sale of its other assets to reduce its debt equity ratio from 127% to 87%. But with a share price trading at two cents, 10, 000, a 10,000 rand investment will buy you half a, half a million shares if that share goes to 8 cents you'll be making a 400% profit so it's risky of course but um, there is a potential for good profits there now I'd like to draw your attention to three property shares the first one I want to talk about is a company called Grit G-R-I-T it's a pan-African company, which means that it buys properties in Africa, but not in South Africa. So it has 25 properties in countries like Ghana and Botswana and Morocco and so forth. The properties that it owns get earn a dollar-denominated rental. For example, it recently acquired an 80% stake in Acacia Estates in Maputo, and the tenants there are, well, the main tenant there is the U.S. Embassy, on a 12-year lease with a very good increment. And of course, the U.S. Embassy is paying it in U.S. dollars. It's got a 97.1% occupancy rate, and at the, uh, in this year of 2019, it's, it's delivered a yield of 8.5% in U.S. dollars, and it's targeting a yield of 12% in 2020. So it looks like a good opportunity to us. 
The next property share I want to talk about is Nepi, uh, or Nepi Rock Castle, which used to, of course, be part of the Resilient Group. Nepi is a 74 billion rand real estate investment trust. It owns 50 shopping malls and in nine Central and Eastern European countries where economic growth has been very strong. Of course, being part of the resilient group, the share fell heavily with the rest of the resilient shares. In fact, it halved, from, or roughly halved, from 217 rand to current levels around 114 rand. It's got a net asset value of 118 rand. And its rental income for the in the year to the 31st of December 2019 went up by 15.8%. And its headline earnings per share went up by 148%. To us, this overseas rand head share looks underpriced. And we reckon that it will go up in due course. The final share that I want to look at today is Hyprop. Also a real estate investment trust specializing in high quality shopping malls. It owns shopping malls like Rosebank, Hyde Park, Canal Walk and so forth. The share is at trading at less than half its net asset value. But it has vacancies of only 1.6% in South Africa and only 0.2% in its European portfolio. We believe that the value which is sitting in the share must be reflected in its share price sooner or later. And you're buying assets at half their net asset value. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to us. I hope you enjoyed our talk. Obviously, you should go and have a look at the notes. There's a great deal more in the notes. Otherwise, I will look forward to seeing you, to talking to you again on the first Wednesday of April.